Hello and welcome. This is, I'm Bob Miscali and this is Planning for the Future. Today is January 31st and with me today are Charlotte Harris and Jed Cornock and I'll give you a little bit of their bios in a little bit. Uh, our topic today is accessory dwelling units and how they can help you plan for the future. This is the fifth show in this series. Uh, we've done a show on Alzheimer's uh, disease. We've done a show on Social Security and retirement planning, uh, elder uh, financial abuse, and caring for uh, an adult with uh, disabilities, intellectual developmental disabilities. And you can uh, find them on YouTube by uh, searching uh, Planning for the Future, Falmouth, and, and my name, Robert Miscali, and it would come up on your, uh, on your YouTube channel. Um, so before I begin, I'd like to uh, thank Deborah Rogers, uh, Bob Fenstermaker, and all of the dedicated staff and volunteers here at Falmouth Community TV for allowing us to put this program on and putting on all of the other wonderful programs that they offer to the community. So as I said, my, my guests are Charlotte Harris and Jed Cornock. Uh, I'll start with Char Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte is a long and distinguished career as a public school teacher in Connecticut and an administrator in Boston, where she retired as director of development for the Boston Public Schools and was responsible for some 9,000 employees in that. Uh, I think the superintendent was responsible. Well, in your <laughs> capacity, you were <laughs> responsible for them. You started visiting Falmouth in 1978 when your parents retired here. You and your sister have been homeowners <laughs> here in town since the early 1990s and moved out here full time in 2007. You're active in your church, a member and volunteer of a number of organizations. Uh, and primarily in, uh, for today's discussion, you are a member of town meeting since 2018 and uh, the chair currently of the Falmouth Planning Board, where you've been on the board since 2017. So thank you for being here, Charlotte. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, and then Jed. Jed Cornock has uh, joined the planning department as assistant town planner in July of 2021 under the supervision of uh, former town planner Tom Bott. At that time, his responsibilities included assisting other planning department staff with planning board's regulatory review, including applications for site plan review, subdivisions, and special permits, and providing support for the historical commission's regulatory review process. Jed has also helped with other long-term planning projects that the planning department were working on at that time, items such as finalizing the mixed residential and commercial overlay district bylaw, and working with consultants on the Davis Straits uh, form-based code bylaw. In December of 2021, Jed became acting town planner when Tom Bott resigned, and in May 2022, uh, we were lucky enough to have him accept the position as town planner. And since that time, he has worked on a number of important projects for the department, notably the second attempt at recodifying the zoning bylaw which was passed uh, at the past town, uh, town meeting in November. Jed brings over 17 years of experience at the re regional planning field to Falmouth, previously focusing on items such as housing production plans, master plan, zoning evaluation, and amendments, complete streets, which is a big thing, uh, well, no big things, but that's particularly important to me in any way, and other technical assistance initiatives. So Jed, thank you for being here as well. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. So, uh, so we're going to talk about accessory dwelling units. Uh, and uh, to start, I'm going to uh, read from the bylaw, the zoning bylaw, as to what the purpose uh, of the uh, accessory apartment bylaw is. And it states uh, to broaden the range of housing choice in Falmouth by increasing the number of small dwelling units available for rent encourage greater diversity of population with particular attention to young adult citizens, allow for aging in place for senior citizens, and promote more economic and energy efficient use of the town's housing supply while maintaining the appearance and character of the town's single family 
uh, neighborhoods. And I think those, those last two, two kind of clauses are really important, uh, the maintaining the appearance and character of the, of the, of the uh, town's neighborhoods. So uh, I'm going to start with you, Jed. Uh, give us a layman's definition of an accessory dwelling unit. Well, that, that's a good question. Uh, I think a, a layman's definition would be um, uh, a, a basically an apartment uh, that is created on someone's property, uh, either being attached to their dwelling or, or within the d existing dwelling, uh, or perhaps detached, in a, perhaps over a garage. Um, and so, you know, we prepared a graphic for, for today's discussion that uh, shows the number of uh, applications that have come before the planning board over the course of the previous six years or so. Um, and so as you can see, uh, 2022 was, was, was generally the, the busiest year that we've had in the planning department in terms of um, bringing in those applications for accessory uh, apartments. Um, and on the graphic, it shows those two types that I just described, the attached and the detached. And overall, you know, when we look back at, at, the, at the data, it indicates that generally half and half uh, people have decided to create a detached versus an attached unit. Um, so both are very popular. Um, what we've seen is a lot of folks uh, create an apartment above their garage. Uh, it's extra space for perhaps um, an in-law or um, their parent, their uh, aging parent. Um, and in some situations, they've created a basement apartment, which, is, which would, we would def define as an attached version. Um, and that basement apartment could generate income someone who just needs a, s a s small space to live and uh, that rent is a little bit cheaper because of the size of the apartment. Uh, so hopefully with that definition that mm -hmm. gets well us that's off. That certainly gets us off to a good discussion. <laughs> Anything you want to add on, on that, Charlotte? Well, I would. I'd like to really emphasize how they connect to planning to everybody's future. Mm -hmm. When my sister and I bought our house in 1991, regular people, you know, on two salaries could buy a house here. Uh, now it's, it's really very difficult for that to happen. So that the ADU that went in really in the mid-teens here in town was the town's first stab at trying to making things more affordable. And we, the, uh, the board, I didn't serve on the board at that time, but those who did serve on it were very, very hopeful that because it would be more affordable, it would add to the rental stock, which we so badly need here in town, and more people would be able to retire in place so that they might have been in the primary residence to begin with and then move into the ADU, or vice versa. Their children, as they're starting out, could move into the secondary unit and things would progress. So it would be keeping our existing population housed and making provision for people to be able to stay in place. And we were disappointed at how uh, slow it was. And part of that is because of the expense involved. Part of that is people not being familiar with it. So that this effort, Bob, is really a big help for people learning about it and learning how easy it is and how widespread they are and to start thinking about, is this a really good uh, bylaw that we have now or is this a bylaw that needs a little bit of tweaking to make it easier for us to reach our goal here? So, so we're really we talking about that. serving two masters. We're, we're talking about the attempt to provide affordable housing for younger folks that might be, as the bylaws mm -hmm. expresses the intent, for younger people coming in, but at the same time to allow old elders to age in place, possibly by going into the second unit or staying in the second unit and having some, uh, some, some funds, some income coming out of the, the smaller unit, they could stay in their, their bigger home as long as, as long as they're physically able to. Jed, how about the, the history of the bylaw, if you can, just a little? Yeah, so it's my understanding that, um, you know, it was before my time coming to town, but my understanding, as Charlotte just mentioned, in 2017 was really the genesis of the accessory apartment bylaw. And um, at that time, they, they made some tweaks to it. Uh, I believe beforehand there was a requirement to do an affordable um, requirement, meaning that in order to rent it, you had to rent it to someone who is earning uh, up to and not exceeding 80% of the area median income. Um, my understanding is that they did away with that and sort of allowed for an easier process. Uh, because after all, what we see uh, in the planning staff and, and the um, planning board sees is these are homeowners who are coming forward to create this 
unit, and um, the easiest path possible is typically the is the best, uh, because we want to encourage folks to create these units that are perhaps not necessarily affordable as as I just described, but as you used the word yesterday, attainable. Mm -hmm. uh, something that's a little bit more or a little less expensive uh, that allows folks to have options. And it creates diversity in the housing stock, which is really, really important. Um, and so in 2018, uh, they went to town meeting, planning board went to town meeting and created some additional calculation information as to how uh, an applicant or a property owner might um, calculate the maximum size of the unit, which I'm sure we'll get into in a few minutes. But um, now we're, you know, we're just going gangbusters. There's, there's quite a few applications coming in um, on the regular. So, uh, and the planning staff is, is working really hard to help property owners understand it. So I think that, that graphic that you had up showed what, about 50 uh, applications since the beginning of the bylaw, was that about right? That's approximately it, yeah. And, and the vast majority is, were, were approved, right? I mean, it's, it's not that big a deal to get approved Correct. as long as you fit, you know, check off the boxes and, and, and fit within what the, what the bylaw says. That's right. So I know uh, we, we found this very handy little brochure that your department has, and anyone could go to yep. Town Hall and pick it up. Uh, but uh, interestingly, uh, it states very clearly, the first step is to schedule a preliminary meeting with, I'm, I'm th with the building commissioner to make sure your project meets the code requirements. So, so that's generally the, the first step, the recommended first step for, for a homeowner to, to, to go through if they're thinking about doing this. Right. Um, and then they're gonna speak to the commissioner and learn some of the technical requirements. And then proceeding along, we'll, we'll, we'll end up going to the planning board for, for a certain review, which we'll talk about. So right. um, you wanna talk a little bit about the, the, the basic requirements and what a homeowner would, would be required to have in order to proceed with a Yeah, you went ADU. lightly over one of the biggest steps mm -hmm. before you go to the building commissioner, right. talk to them, get the general lay of the land, then you come to the planning department right. and they are the handholders. They are the people who are going to go through the technical review with you, be sure that you do meet mm -hmm. all the requirements before it gets to the planning board. Right. Yep. So that they're doing all the technical bits and the reason that we have refused so few is two reasons. One, the purpose of the planning board is not to turn people down. We're supposed to be there to be helping people to develop and develop along the lines that the town wants to see happen and we've got a lot of documents on what we want to see happen. So it's to help people, not to stop people. Yep. And particularly on the ADU, wanting this to go forward so that if it comes to the planning board and it still isn't uh, quite baked enough, we would not say no. We would give suggestions that they may or may not take and go back and they can come forward again. So it's uh, an iterative process, not a one stop. Okay. And the role of the planning department is vital in that. Well, well thanks. Thank you for clarifying that. We also skip that. the big reason for doing an ADU. Some people, the way that they can stay in their home longer is they have rental property. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So that they've really put in a money maker mm -hmm. um, on their lot. Yeah. Yep. So uh, some of the you know, technical requirements, I know there's size limitations, there's bedroom limitations, there's occupancy limitations. I think those are probably the, the right. three biggest ones. So Yeah, so I'll, I'll hit the high notes. Sure. So, so first and foremost, only one accessory apartment is allowed per lot. So that's the, f the first one. Um, the second, in order to qualify to do an accessory apartment, your lot size has to be at least 70 7,500 square feet, and that's if you have your own private septic system. If you happen to be lucky enough to be on the sewer system, it can go as low as 7,000 square feet. So it's a very small lot um, that allows for it. And again, that's the minimum size. So nothing smaller than that, uh, than that square footage. Um, then the apartment size, this is sort of what I was uh, referring to earlier. The accessory apartment can be no larger than 800 square feet or 40% of the principal dwelling. And so there's a, uh, there's a calculation in the bylaw, which w we generally have to help property owners understand how to calculate that 40%. But basically you can take uh, whichever is less of those two numbers, either 800 square feet or the 40%. Um, and generally people, what we see is they, they, 
they were trying to get to as close to 800 square feet as possible. Um, in fact, what we've heard in, in just anecdotally in the department is, you know, sometimes 800 is a little too small. Uh, and so that might be something that the planning board might want to consider moving forward to say, well, is it too small or is it just the right size? But nevertheless, that's the, that's the um, requirement. Um, another factor is that the fo building footprint for the accessory dwelling can't exceed the footprint of the principal dwelling. That is to say, the foundation itself can't be larger than the principal dwelling. Um, and then there is a maximum number of bedrooms that you can have on the property. That usually comes into play when the property is less than 20,000 square feet. So if you have a lot that's smaller than 20,000 square feet. Which is feet, a half acre yep. uh, for the most. Yep, yep half acre. Uh, you can't have more than four uh, bedrooms on the lot. If it's larger than 20,000, there isn't a cap on the number of bedrooms. However. Except. <laughs> <laughs> except if you're in a coastal pond overlay district, there's a bedroom to square footage ratio that we have to walk through with the applicant. So there's a lot of, um, I guess, uh, detail in, in the bylaw that we have to help folks understand. But once they go through it once, it, it's generally pretty easy to get through. But I, I think what, uh, what deters a lot of people in addition to those technical space requirements is this need to stay in the house or be owner occupied and so forth. You want to speak on that or Jed? Oh, that makes it difficult for people to do? Well, what the requirement is for the owner to be on the property and seven months. limiting the, the rental and yeah, so they forth. They have to right. attest that they're going to be there seven months and the, the bylaw requires that they um, provide an affidavit to that effect once a year to the building commissioner. The building commissioner is the inspector for the town. They're responsible for enforcement, for monitoring. So it's showing up there and mailing in once a year your affidavit saying yes, um, I'm the owner and I'm there seven months unless you have an excuse like military service or some, mm -hmm. something where an exception can be made. So you do, it does have to be owner occupied. I mean, and you don't have to rent it. I mean, it's certainly you could have uh, an in-law situation in the, sm in the smaller apartment helping pay for the upkeep and utilities yep. and so forth and the family in the larger unit or, or vice versa without any limitation whatsoever. The, the bylaw prevents uh, short-term rentals. Correct. And, Correct. and so monthly rental, weekly rental, what, what, what the bylaw refers to as seasonal rentals Correct. are not permitted. That's right. So if you are going to rent and uh, as an income producing as opposed to a family kind of a arrangement with an in-law, uh, you, you need to rent it for a certain period of time. Correct. Is that and both units cannot be rented at the same time. That is to say the principal dwelling and the apartment cannot be rented. So the time. owner always, w if it's being rented, the owner has to more or less be there. Correct. For at least seven we're months of the year. Right. Yeah, well, the residential requirement applies to the owner, mm -hmm. not the renter. Mm -hmm. right. So the renters may or may not be seasonal, uh, but the owner has to be there seven, seven months of the year. That's right. Okay. Um, so you know, I know uh, Charlotte pointed out that uh, that the uh, a big part of what your staff does uh, is uh, uh, hand holding, if if you will. Uh, so that we prefer the term building friendships. Build, building <laughs> friendships. <laughs> we Fair hope. enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, does does someone need a professional in order to get this ball rolling? That's another deterrent to, to people when they think about doing this. They they hear, oh, I need an architect. I need an engineer. I need a septic guy. I need you know, plans. Uh, what what is that? absolutely necessary well it depends uh, you know I hate using that that answer uh, right off the bat but so for example if you're doing a uh, basement apartment um, typically you wouldn't need uh, a surveyed plan uh, because those come into play when you're creating uh, another structure on the lot that may or may not impede on setbacks uh, certain things that we would have to review um, but for the most part having professionals is a good idea having a surveyor prepare a site plan for the planning board to review, making sure that the septic plan is up to date because those are certain things that the bylaw stipulates that you have to comply with, but also having an architect, especially for 
when you're creating a detached unit. A brand new construction, an architect is absolutely, um, absolutely needed. And that's why we refer everyone to the building commissioner to make sure that they have that conversation up front with the building commissioner to say, well, I plan to do this. And the building commissioner will say, okay, you're gonna need, I'm gonna need this type of plan and this type of plan and this type of plan. So the applicant or the property owner is aware of the types of professionals they may have to hire. So you, you mentioned detached. Uh, so why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because the process is a little different whether the accessory dwelling is a basement or, or attached to the home right. or whether it's a separate, uh, separate building or part of a garage that's not attached to the house. What's, what's the differences there? E excellent question. So um, when it's an attached, meaning it's within the principal dwelling, either in the basement or perhaps in an addition to the dwelling, the planning board is the only regulatory review that's required, and that's only site plan review with the planning board. However, when it's detached, say it's a garage or what have you, some sort of accessory dwelling that's separate from the principal dwelling, that involves both the planning board and the zoning board of appeals. So the planning board does site plan review and then the zoning board of appeals does a special permit. So your, your, your board is involved in all of them. The zoning board would only be involved if they were attached, uh, detached. If it's unit. going to be detached. Yeah. You know, in a lot of ways, the ADU are, is an exception to a, a major provision of the rest of the bylaws. The uh, single family houses, which are like 85% of the houses in Falmouth, and building a single family house. Um, are not covered by the planning board. They, that's a by right use, you can go ahead and do it, and you have to meet the setbacks and all of that, but it's free of the permitting process. But ADUs, a residential use, that's the one thing that's involved in the permitting process. And because the Zoning Board of Appeals gets involved in the uses, and this is changing the use of the lot, the lot is now going to go from being a single family house to something else. That involves the Zoning Board of Appeals hearing to see whether or not that's going to be allowed. So it's a, a double review for that purpose, maintaining the distinction between the jurisdictions of the two boards. Some people have one that I can think of, maybe there have been others, were planning a separate one and they really didn't want the double permitting issue, so they added a, a, a roof, a covered breezeway like thing breezeway. to connect them mm -hmm. yeah. to see what would happen there. But that's, that's a rare thing to do. Do you have a ballpark, Jed, as to, of the applications, how many were detached that ended up going to the ZBA and how many were, you know, part of the principal dwelling and didn't need that? Yeah, so in that graphic, roughly half, half of the applications that we've seen in the past six years have been detached and half of them have been attached. And I know that uh, there's no requirement uh, for the applicant to say what they're going to do with it, but Again, anecdotally, sure. uh, what is your sense of what's really motivating you know, the majority of people? Is it income? Is it uh, you know, uh, to uh, you know, have family closer? I mean, what, what, what do you think are the major motivations? Yeah, so uh, our planning, you know, what we've heard uh, is sort of a mix. Um, we've had a few people come in and, and look for that extra income, um, but there's been, a, a, I would say, the vast majority um, uh, that have wanted to keep family close. And when I said you know, earlier that it was a mix, some of them are for allowing their older parents to age in place. But as Charlotte, you mentioned uh, in the beginning, the reverse is also true, that the older uh, parents would take the smaller ADU and allow their family mm -hmm. members to stay in the larger principal dwelling. By the time they get to the planning board, um, for the final review to see if it's going to be permitted. There's a real difference between the regular business that we do, mostly commercial things, and the way the ADUs are presented. Typically for the commercial projects, almost entirely, the person who's standing up to the microphone and to speak to us is a real estate lawyer, or the engineer, or the architect. It's, it's a professional whose stamped drawings are required, and there they are. But for the ADUs, for the most part, it's the homeowner. And no, they're not required to say, but because that's their motivation and what got them there to begin with, they volunteer it so they that we're apt to hear it. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it, it um, is working out the way of the board when it created this thing, wanted it to, 
that it would be easier and less demanding to meet the paperwork requirements and meet the professional support requirements of an ADU in order to hold the expenses down and make it more possible for people to do this. And that part seems to be working. Uh, how about the septic issue? What, is, what, what does that entail? Another reason I think that deters some people from pursuing it because they don't want to you know, get, get involved in, in that. Sure. Yeah, and, and I think water quality is, is one of the is one of the most important topics that we have in town. You know, it perhaps is equally important as, as affordable housing. And septic comes into play with water quality because as everyone understands, you know, the nutrients that you know, are released into the water table um, are damaging to our coastal ponds, uh, especially the nitrogen. And so, as I mentioned before, the coastal pond overlay district uh, was created to essentially map out my understanding, and I'm certainly not an expert in that, um, but to map out where the recharge areas are for those coastal ponds. They essentially cover mu much of the town. So if you happen to be a property owner who is in a coastal pond overlay district, you are um, essentially not allowed to exceed the ratio of one bedroom to 10,000 square feet of lot size unless you put in a specific type of nitrogen reducing um, septic system. So you're essentially mitigating the impact that you might have by creating another new bedroom. construction. This is new construction. Uh, it, yeah, it's it's any of the applications that come. So uh, uh, there will be a, a, a full acre lot would be a four be four bedrooms, mm -hmm. right? Right. I, if they have four bedrooms. Yeah. yeah or, but uh, and then if it was more than four bedrooms. Right. They would need to. They would need to either put in uh, some mitigation to take care of the nitrogen or they would have to reconfigure their principal dwelling to allow for that new accessory dwelling unit, meaning take one of the bedrooms out of their principal dwelling and essentially transfer it to this accessory apartment. So yesterday when we were talking <laughs> about our, uh, our discussion today, you, you gave me a bit of a, uh, an education on, uh, on, on how, how you actually do that and how you convert a, a bedroom and get it out of the computation for, for septic purposes. I think people would find that to be uh, helpful information. Sure. Yeah, so again, my understanding is a, a bedroom has three characteristics in terms of what is a bedroom when we talk about um, town review of that. It's privacy, which includes a door. Um, it's a certain square footage, and it needs to have either one or two windows. I can't remember exa the exact number, but it essentially has to have a window, another means of egress. Uh, one of the things that property owners might do is they would remove the privacy. So they would remove the door and they would create a larger opening so a door couldn't be put back in after, after an inspection um, and essentially convert that bedroom into something else. A lot of people say we'll convert it into an office, could be a, a, a den, some sort of sewing room, whatever mm -hmm. it may be, but it's no longer a bedroom or considered a bedroom. Um, and therefore, they're able to take a, say, a four-bedroom house, convert it to a three, and then transfer, transfer that, bedroom that bedroom to the, to accessory, the accessory apartment. apartment. Right. Okay. Uh, so we've been talking a lot about the, the technical aspects of the bylaw. Let's, uh, let's talk about what, uh, what the planning board is most concerned about and what you're looking at for uh, the applications that come before you. By the time they're coming to us, we, and we check with Jeb, so he has to say it right there in public, do they meet the technical requirements? And the answer is yes. And then the planning board is going to be most interested in uh, the judgment calls. And the judgment deals with the impact on the neighborhood, the appropriateness architecturally of this thing. And the bylaw itself um, tried to regulate that to say, to maintain the appearance of a single family neighborhood. Because Falmouth is made up of single family neighborhoods, how do you maintain that appearance? when you're really turning them into two family lots with this, potentially at any rate. So we're looking at the character of what you're planning, the architectural character. And it has to mimic the architectural effect of the, the primary building. So you know that most of the primary buildings see houses are Cape Cod style with a pitch roof, some with dormers, some with wings and so forth, with that Cape Cod look. And how do you maintain that in the new building that you're planning? 
or if you're going to change your garage and make it a two-story garage in order to put something above it, how do you keep that look? And there are different answers to that, and the board is looking at it. People have to come with photographs or pictures of their existing building and a rendering, usually, of what they're planning to do to see, does this match? Do they look the same? Are the materials the same? Are the windows similar? The doorway similar? Does it look as if it might have been built, maybe not all at once, but with consistency of architectural effect? And that's mostly, by then, what we're concerned with. The, uh, the rest of the requirements, really, are about health and safety. Um, but ours is about, the board is about the character and maintaining the character of the neighborhood and the town. Uh, I think you brought some some diagrams. Maybe we can uh, we can pull up that graphic. And yeah, that uh, second graphic is. Jed, Jed can yeah. explain some of the different uh, the styles that we have, or if, if you have that. Yeah, so that's an example of um, an application that came before the board um, approximately a few months ago. Okay. Uh, but what it shows, and you know, I've uh, you know uh, eliminated any of the identifying right. uh, address or, or mm -hmm. companies, but. Essentially what it shows is that in a, this accessory dwelling unit is a detached example. So it's essentially a very small house that this uh, property owner is building in their backyard. Um, and so this would be one of the images that the planning board gets to review. It's the elevation. So it, they get to see that. And on the second page of that attachment uh, is the interior. So here's some photographs of what the interior might look like and also what the floor plan looks like. Um, to get a sense for exactly what we just were talking about. So the the, 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 the picture on the bottom is the main house? No. Nope, oh, is, that, is that the second, that's the accessory dwelling unit, both, both up correct, and down? Correct. Okay. Right. And so what we get a sense for is where okay. are the bedrooms? Right. Where are the kitchen? Does it have all the facilities that it needs to have? Th those types of things. In addition to the floor plan and the elevations, um, is the site plan. That's very important for the planning board to consider because, as I mentioned before, when you have a detached unit and you're creating another structure on the lot, you need to make sure you know where it is. It meets all the dimensional requirements of the lot, set back from the road, set back from other um, types of things on the property. But in addition to that, is you know one of the most important things the planning board thinks about all the time is parking. So making sure that there's adequate parking for the accessory dwelling unit. Off-site. Correct. On their property, not on the street. So th they go through, the property owner goes through your, your review and you say it's good. Now if it's a detached uh, situation, where does it go first, ZBA or planning board? Always comes to the planning board first. Okay, so the planning board is looking at, well, you tell me what it's, uh, what it's doing in that situation. We're looking at all the things that are under our purview. Does it meet the setbacks? which basically pushes whatever you're doing to the back of your back of your primary residence because of the side setbacks, the front setbacks. And does it meet the, uh, we have already been assured that the fire department, the health department, the water department all approve of what you're doing. And we are looking at it from the standpoint of neighborhood character, the char architectural character of the house and what's proposed, but not the issue of the new use for the lot. Right. So once all those things are settled, then it goes to the ZBA for the new use for the lot. And once they approve it, then it goes back to building for s permits and the project proceeds. That's right. Right, and, uh, and in monitoring it, uh, there's always an issue of, well, did they do what they say? I mean, they, they promised all this. How is it turning out? That's up to the building commissioner. And the building commissioner can control that by not giving you an occupancy permit until you've done what the drawings um, and what has been uh, stated that you're going to do, now it's complete. Uh, one thing you mentioned by, while you were speaking that, that hit me, and I think it's important to note, uh, this, the, the, the need to still comply with all setback requirements of the zone that the, that the property is in. Why don't you speak a little bit about that? That would be 25 feet back from the road, 10 feet in from either side for most of the lots in town. Um, some of the lots downtown, it would be a little less, depending on the kind so of So you thing. can't build it in, the fr in your front yard, basically. Basically, You're you can't build anything in your front yard right. in Falmouth. We tried right. to put a shed mm. way off to the side, mm. never thought of it at the front, but the town thought it was the front. <laughs> so that was a conversation that had to take place. So at 25 feet back, 
So that if you look at the front line of your house, the and it has to be back behind that. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, that means the backyard. It's either the backyard or if you have enough property, a side yard could, right. as long as you have the But then you the have to have the, the 10 back. feet in from, mm -hmm. the, from uh, the sides. Well, Charles, you were good enough to refer me to a article from the New York Times that just coincidentally happened to, uh, to be in the Sunday Times. Right, uh, this and Sunday. And I just, I wanted to, uh, I wrote down a quote if I can, uh, I, I can find it. One, uh, so interestingly, California's experience is kind of mimics uh, what, what Jed was talking about, but it, the story, the article said uh, that in 2016, there were 1,200 accessory dwelling units, and in 2021, there were over 20,000 accessory twenty Yeah, in, in, uh, in, in California. But one of the officials said that uh, uh, the, the ADUs create housing that doesn't alter, and this is what you've been saying, uh, Charlotte, doesn't alter the look or feel of the community by increasing capacity within the existing footprint, with the, what the article referred to as gentle density, without the need for government investment and infrastructure and has the effect of reducing the utility costs. So I assume that, uh, that that's what you would be looking at as well, that feel uh, of the, and character of the, the community. The feel and the character and, and the to be sure that it does have all those amenities that a house requires. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really enforcing that so that you can have a builder or I don't want to impute it to any one profession, but anyone come in and put in a house that's actually unlivable um, that wouldn't have the correct sewage, that wouldn't have a water supply and utilities. So it's all of those check guards. The thing that struck me in that article in the New York Times is, wow, how common they are. Um, most of the states have, states have provisions for ADU. In Massachusetts, over 100 communities have provisions for ADU. So we were not um, pioneers in any sense in bringing this in, into Falmouth, but now people are finding real problems with the ADU provisions that were originally passed because people were trying to maintain the feeling of their town, which of course they love, and we love Falmouth. So we don't want Falmouth to radically, suddenly change um, and double the density all over the place. So the way it's written is to kind of make sure that it's a controlled increase in that density. And we might want to look over time to see, yes, it's working and it's increasing. Is there some way that we can tweak it so it would be easier these are expensive, as you brought up when we were talking. Yes, I, I was at a conference uh, in September, and uh, one of the towns on the Outer Cape, I think it was Wellfleet, but I can't, can't be sure, actually has a, uh, uh, a portfolio of four already approved designs and plans to you know, lessen the financial burden mm -hmm. on homeowners who want to do this and if you can walk in with that plan and willing to you know build according to that plan then you've saved some some money and some some time in getting the project up and running so it's certainly something that uh, you know that that the town might look towards uh, you know in the future to make it a little easier for uh, for homeowners a little less uh, uh, a little less uh, financially burdensome for them uh, a, a bigger problem, uh, not a bigger problem, but a big problem is how do you pay for this? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, a number of banks uh, here on the Cape have lessened the verification requirements for income in order to justify the, uh, the, the, the issuance of a mortgage to the homeowner so that they can uh, manage a property. As you know, if, if, you're, if you're looking for a mortgage, you have to give them all the information about your finances, your income, their verification. They go back and, and, and look. I think what, uh, you know, in response to the need for accessory dwelling units, uh, while still maintaining their financial integrity and what they need to, to, uh, to consider, they are permitting uh, the homeowner to have some kind of a uh, idea of what rental income they're going to get uh, mm -hmm. in order to justify or, or give them 
the assurance that the mortgage would be paid. So uh, we unfortunately were, we tried to get a representative from, from one of the local banks and it just didn't, uh, just didn't work out. But, uh, but I, they did send me, bo both banks did send me some information and I will, I'm uh, just gonna take a moment to re read some of the, the requirements. Uh, uh, this comes from Martha's Vineyard Bank. Uh, their ADU mortgage program must be installed on the property securing the loan. It must be one to four family primary residence. I don't know where that fits within the, the, the bylaw, but y yeah, that's, it that's one like of their requirements. Sounds oh. like it would fit. It, the yep. principal dwelling, if, if I understood that right, could be one to four bedrooms. Yep. Provided I understood that right. <laughs> <laughs> Borrower must provide a copy of an executed contract with a licensed and insured general contractor, including all costs and the schedule of value. Borrower should provide a copy of a special permit evidencing any restriction on the amount of rent that they may charge, which some towns, I think, limit the, uh, the amount of rent that can be charged. And mm -hmm. appraisal will be ordered. Uh, and a maximum of 75% of the gross anticipated rent from the ADU can be used for income qualification purposes. That's what I was referring to before. Uh, Cape Cod 5 also sent uh, over some information. Uh, I guess the, the, the mechanism for doing it can be a home equity loan, which uh, is, is uh, another way of, of financing it, but I think the um, you know, the interest payments sometimes vary with a home equity loan and with the ra rise in uh, the prime rate and all of the other rates, many of the home equity loans are going up, uh, they're not set. Whereas a, uh, you know, traditional mortgage bank might uh, issue a second mortgage on the property or work with the property owner to uh, refinance the first mortgage and, and, and figure that money in. But they have the same uh, same types of requirements. Uh, the borrow, <coughs> excuse me, borrow must provide approval from the town authorizing construction. Uh, must approve provide a copy of uh, an agreement with a contractor, uh, which who is licensed, of course. Funds will be fully dispersed. The first uh, twice. Uh, the first uh, disbursement is to the property owner and the contractor, 50% of the loan amount then the balance would go, uh, go to the borrower to pay off the contractor and, and any liens that would have. And again, like the other one, uh, a borrower may use up to 75% of documented expected rental income uh, to qualify. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's very encouraging that, that the banks are seeing the, the need for ADUs and trying to tweak their requirements in order to, uh, uh, to, to allow for financing because uh, it is, you know, I've, I've heard in the range of, <coughs> let's say, um, you know, 300, $350 a square foot, maybe a little more if you're looking at, at sewer and, and, and so forth. So, um, you know, I think for- It really for depends on the size of your plan because sure. of what you're doing is adapting an existing space in an attic, um, in a garage, it's obviously going to be a great deal less expensive than building a separate structure. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to give any pricing on it. The one thing that hold, seems to hold true, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's the firewall requirement. Um, so that if you, one thought when this was being put together is, wasn't this great? All the in-law apartments that apparently repeatedly exist all over town can now become legal. Well, no, they really can't because they are probably a room over the garage with a bathroom, may or may not have a kitchen, a modified kitchen of some sort, but probably have no firewall between that and the, and the primary residence. And those can be expensive. And I have no idea uh, what a ballpark figure on that would be or how that works. So you can't really do it for next to nothing. It will be something. In the, uh, a book I got a hold of called Backdoor Revolution of people trying to do this, um, they're recommending things you can do to make it better and easier and cheaper for people to do and give up the owner occupancy one. If you picture a situation where people, um, and it's a really pretty commonplace situation where people have bought a house here in Falmouth and they're using it now in the summer but the rest of the time they're renting it out 
but they're planning to retire there. So this is a, like a long-range plan for their family. And part of that long-range plan is, oh, what are we going to do with uh, Granny and Grandpa? Well, we'll put them in an ADU, and we'll build it now while our earnings justify the increase in the mortgage. Oh, you can't do it. It has to be owner-occupied. So that might be they're recommending that as one thing to at least think about uh, changing the parking, particularly for downtown. The restrictions on having them only on lots of a certain size when where you might really want them is sort of infill um, in the downtown areas. There's a lot that could be done if we really want to add to the rental property in town, keep the character of the, of the neighborhood, but make it a little easier. And we might be thinking of that. But you raise up a, a good point, Charlotte. And, and uh, have, had Jeff, have you seen any, uh, or let's put it this way, what would a homeowner who has a reputed in-law suite mm. that, that do want to legalize, have, have you seen any of those actual applications and what's, what's involved? I mean, Charlotte mentions the firewall, but. Sure. You know. Well, they don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, that's, and that's another, you know, tie back to the building commissioner. That's, again, why we would, uh, you know, send uh, property owners down there to, to make sure that they understand what the building code requires for any project that they're working on, because uh, that's very, very important. And, uh, and to Charlotte's point about the firewall, you know, we're, we're planners. We, you know, we don't tr traditionally get into those, uh, those details. But we have seen quite a few property owners who have come forward uh, who have perhaps just bought the property and didn't realize that there was a, an apartment uh, in the basement um, and they want to legalize it so that they can rent it out or perhaps um, there's extra space above uh, their garage and you know someone's always used it as an apartment but it's not formalized we certainly see those applications and and so basically what they need to do is is try to fit within the rules of the bylaw a lot of those uh, fitting exercises is making the apartment smaller. Um, and so they may have to create walls that, you know, essentially cordon off the, the uh, accessory apartment, make it fit within that 40% rule or the 800 square feet. And if they have all the uh, necessary building code requirements, they're good to go. Uh, but we, d we do see applications like that. So I think we're getting close to the end here. Do you have anything to, uh, to add, either one of you? Um, I'm glad to have the opportunity to, to talk about the ADUs and hope that there will be more of them. But want to point out uh, just a couple of other things, if that's Please. okay. This, this is what we're working from. These are the town bylaws. And as you can see, there are a lot of them, but they're in big print. And we just recently completely redid it so that they're easier to use. Every citizen is entitled to a copy. You come down to the planning department and you can pick one up. And if you have any questions, the planning department is there to help you with it. And the ADUs appear in two things in use tables. They're in the agricultural section, and they're in the residential right. section. They're identical, but they're repeated so that you can read what the requirements are. And you can pretty much find the other parts of the code that apply to it. So there's that part to, s to say. Uh, yeah, just one, one thing before you, 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 you say uh, anything now. Um, the, the, the bylaw was changed in November. Correct. Well, at, mm -hmm. at, at <laughs> <laughs> it's that word that you use, change. Change. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, well it was tweaked. Yes. Okay. It, it, yeah. What, what were some of the, 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 the changes for people if they may not be aware of the change and it might be something that, that they Do would? Do you mean the change when it was first reorganized or when we had to tweak it again? When you had to tweak it again. Okay, because the first right. one, there was no problem with the content. Right. The problem, according to the Attorney General, was that in explaining to town meeting what did we do, we didn't use the word change. We said there <laughs> was no change, that we were just taking the old material and putting it in a better organized format. And the Attorney General said, oh, that's not quite true. There are changes here. And their idea of a change and our idea of a change were not the same but they're the people who get to say what's a change. So we had to change it um, and go back to town meeting and say, here it is, and hope that it's approvable this time. But we're now making it available to people. So it's there. It's a much easier format to use. So it really wasn't any substantive change? 
it was a substantive embarrassment, I think, but not a substantive change. Okay. So someone who was looking at something a, a year or two ago, it really hasn't changed, even though that's we right. have a new bylaw. That's, that's right. That's the point. Right. In fact, there's a process that will be going forward. It got started and then it got halted over this business of having to go back and retread the, the vote. Um, of as we were going through it to transfer it into its new format, naturally it turned up all kinds of things that we wish were different, and lists were made of that by the consultants, by the people in the offices downtown working on it, and now we'll be working on what are those desirable changes. So that's the next step. Okay, well that's good, good to know. Jed, want to add anything else? Yeah, I, uh, other than just a thank you uh, for you, for to you for inviting us to talk and to SCTV, the folks here have been excellent, and I think it's a great way to advertise uh, a really excellent program and to try and break it down for people to understand that it's it's really not that complicated, and we're here to help. Well, uh, it's evident, and thank you, uh, thank you for both being here. Mm -hmm. I think it is a very important. Uh, issue for people to know, and uh, and it's good to know that uh, uh, that the town planning board, uh, planning department is is there to build friendships. That's right. Uh, and that the uh, at, and the planning board is there to uh, 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 keep watch on the on the feel and the character of the community. Uh, so while uh, building friendships, while building, building friendships, friendships, we hope. So, <laughs> so I think that that'll uh, wrap it up for for today. I th I think a future program. I I would like to see if we could get the building commissioner, uh, mm -hmm. and the someone from the zoning board of appeals, to to to, to speak further on on, sure. on on the issue. So again, thank you to FCTV for giving us the opportunity, and uh, we'll see you again, planning for your future. Thank you. Thank you, Bob.